Welcome to Beauty and the Biz. Discover how to grow your practice with effective cosmetic patient attraction, conversion, and retention advice from author, speaker, trainer, and cosmetic practice business and marketing coach, Catherine Maley, MBA. Hello and welcome to Beauty and the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's episode is a little different. It's Dr. Andrew Kaufman. Now, he's a board-certified dermatologist specializing in Mohs Dermatologic and Cosmetic Surgery in Thousand Oaks, California, and he has been practicing for over 28 years. Now, Dr. Kaufman is a recognized expert in Mohs and Reconstructive Surgery and author of numerous publications on facial reconstruction following skin care surgery, skin cancer surgery, as well as a frequently invited speaker at national and international meetings. Now, I wanted to talk to him because he recently sold his practice, and we've been talking about that a lot lately, like how do you walk away from a practice? So I wanted to get his take on it because his practice is now known as Forefront Dermatology. So we're going to talk about the specifics of that transaction. Dr. Kaufman, welcome to Beauty in the Biz. Thanks, Catherine. It's good to be with you. Thanks so much. So why don't you just start by describing your practice before you sold it or partnered or whatever you want to call it. What was your practice consisting of? So uh, I, I, my practice is primarily in Thousand Oaks in Santa Barbara, and I had uh, moved to that area about 28, 29 years ago uh, after I'd completed a Mohs fellowship at UC San Francisco and joined a general medical dermatologist. I knew pretty well that I, I would do well in the area because there weren't many, there weren't any Mohs surgeons at the time in the area. And I had done residencies in dermatology down there and a residency in internal medicine. So I knew primary care physicians and dermatologists. And I knew there was a need for, uh, for a, a Mohs surgeon. So I was able to build up over time. I bought his practice and then we added additional uh, dermatologists over time to the point where there's approximately five or six uh, general medical dermatologists and a facial plastic surgeon who also does you know, facelifts, rhinodectomies, and rhinoplasties, blepharoplasties, whatever is necessary that the other doctors aren't doing. Um, so uh, that's pretty much what my practice had been before I started considering, a, a, you know, an exit strategy. And did you have a pathology lab? Uh, we didn't have a laboratory. We do have a, a board-certified dermatopathologist who's read all of our uh, slides since uh, she's been there for the last eight to 10 years, probably. Gotcha. Now, how many staff did you have? So you had five derma five dermatologists plus you, plus yeah. facial plastics. How many staff? It's somewhere between 30 and 40, somewhere around there, probably, maybe a little more. Yeah. Who is managing all of this? So, you know, over time, there's a number of different administrators or managers that I've uh, worked with and, uh, some very good and some not quite as good. I was fortunate in the latter part of my uh, my career as a as a practice owner that I had a very good one administrator who kind of helped me through uh, the processes that I was going through. And what was your biggest challenge? Would you say running a solo practice? Uh, well, you know, in California, it ain't easy to uh, to make a living and stuff. Things are expensive. Uh, uh, HR, you know, human resources, employees are expensive, doctors are expensive, uh, health insurance is expensive, but at the same time, reimbursement from uh, commercial carrier insurances continues to go downward. Um, so I think the biggest challenge is, is uh, running a business when uh, expenses keep going up, but reimbursement keeps going down. Right. So now it's Somehow, what got on your radar? Like, what did the, this, um, what's it called? Forward Dermatology? Forefront Dermatology. Forefront Dermatology. How did they get on your radar? And were you even thinking about your exit strategy? Yeah, I mean, the whole point was, you know, I've been doing this close to 30 years. And uh, I'm the uh, uh, sole, you know, uh, uh, practice owner. So I kind of had to come up with a an exit strategy that made sense. I didn't want to develop, you know, an illness or die or 
mm-hmm. got injured or something that was going to seriously impair the uh, the practice. And so I started considering exit strategies. And first, the first option uh, would have been, could have been, you know, selling to my associates. They weren't interested really, you know, part of it's kind of a generational thing. Um, nowadays, a lot of people aren't really looking, they're not particularly entrepreneurial and they would rather come in, work and go home, uh, which is fine. I respect that, but they weren't really interested. And then a uh, second option is I looked at also was uh, academic centers like UCLA and USC, Cedar sinai and Stanford to see if they had any interest in having a satellite uh, you know, dermatology office and uh, ambulatory surgery center in Thousand Oaks and Santa Barbara. And uh, there really wasn't, you know, although in the past they, there had been some interest uh, with some uh, dermatology and other practices, right now they're not really interested in buying uh, private practices. And after that, then I started looking at uh, private equity based groups primarily. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, a few that are in California. And then there's a few more that are that want to come to California. Um, so, uh, you know, we went through a, a number of different uh, groups and kind of vetted them to see what was going to be the best fit. But how would you know? Like, do you, like, this is so new for you. How did you know what you were looking for? Well, there's certain things, you know, that I wanted in the deal that, you know, were important to me. And there was, and it varies between the different groups as to who's willing to do what. And uh, there's also, you know, there's a difference between the groups. You know, you, you know, when you meet people, uh, there's a difference between people who are running the group and whether you, if you feel that that's going to be a good fit for you. Um, to me, it was important that things w- were ran as smoothly as possible after the close of the deal as it had before the deal. So spent a lot of time trying to get to know the people and and kind of like what their uh, thought process was and how things would have worked out. I wanted things to be similar for not just myself, but the other doctors and my staff and my patients. So that was kind of important to me. And, you know, other other factors were also important to me. And you know, for example, things like, uh, you know, whether or not stock was available. They felt if I was going to help the, their company grow, I wanted to benefit from that to some degree. Um, I wanted to have my cash up, you know, at the time of close. I didn't want to have 20% of it or whatever dangled out there for several years for somebody else to decide whether or not I get it. Um and uh, things like that. Um, that's a really interesting point because we've been talking a lot about private equity. You didn't go with private equity. You went with a physician-based led. What is it? Is it? Well, no, it is. It is a private equity okay. group. Um, generally, all of the private equity groups have a physician board and physician president um, because, in order to uh, uh, practice a medicine, they have to have. Uh, a, a, a physician as their leader, but it's a business. And okay. when I talk to people about it, I try to uh, make it clear that um, this this is these people are it's a company. It's a and they want to they want to get a return on their investment. Mm-hmm. They want to get the best deal that they can. And so you know I think that uh, best thing a person can do is. Make sure that you have a good accountant and a good attorney, both of which are well versed and well experienced in mergers and acquisitions, especially in uh, healthcare. Because you want people on your team that have done this a lot before and know what's right and what isn't right, what all the tricks are, and what's the proper thing so that you're well represented. That's a really good pearl. Um, not just legal, but somebody who really specializes in M&A for healthcare. Like right. that's pretty specific. And is there a reason you went with such a big group? Do you, does that feel more, I don't know, certain when you, I mean, that's a really big group that you went with. Um, did, did that make you feel more secure that they had more money that they, because you're saying that you got a pretty good, it sounds like you got a pretty good cash outlay right from the get go. Cause usually there's a lot of dangling on the back end. You know, well, I mean, pretty good is all relative. <laughs> so, um, 
so you know it's like i said it wasn't the, the main my main interest was to set something up for an exit strategy mm-hmm. so that uh my, my, i would be safe my patients would be safe my staff would have jobs and stuff like that we wouldn't have to worry about stuff so the number one thing was i wanted to be certain that things were going to be stable so yeah i guess having a a larger group um associated with it you don't have to worry quite so much about financial issues we were really the second group that they had uh they had purchased in california so they mm-hmm. were brand new to the west coast and um you know they're still they're still they're looking and meeting with other groups now and doing deals with other groups right now but the main thing was you know i wanted what i considered to be a fair price for my practice and I wanted some of those other things I talked about. And I wanted to feel like things were going to be as close to where it was uh, after the deal as it was before the deal. Exactly. Um, by the way, what were they looking for? But did you, did you do you own your building or was it just a long lease that they liked? Or what were they? Why did you look attractive to them? Um, so, you know, the uh, dermatology has been kind of a target for private equity groups for a number of years now. And um, they they like dermatology because they have skin cancer, they have dermatopathology and dermatopathology labs, and then they also have cosmetic. And um, they feel that, you know, that's, you know, they can do well, that they can, they can do well in their business model with those things. So, um, so I mean, they're, you know, we have a pretty, you know, robust, good sized uh, dermatology practice with three different offices. So that was probably attractive to them. You know, we, I do a fair amount of Mohs surgery. We have derm path, we have people doing cosmetics. So those are the things probably w- were attractive to them. For sure. And then were several groups kind of courting you or can you play them off of each other? Is Was that a strategy? I'm just so many surgeons or surgeons are looking at this saying, I don't even know who to talk to. Like, where do you even begin? Um, Any advice on that? Um, I don't want to say you can play off of them, but you can get an idea about what each is going to be offering. And maybe you can get an idea from a couple at the same time. Um, But once you set, once you sign an LOI, a letter of intent, you're really just, you're, you're planning to get married to one. So you can't keep playing that. So I'd say you can get an idea from the different groups and then go with one over the other or two. You can talk to two or three at one time, but you know it gets kind of confusing and complicated when uh, you start doing more than that because you know you're sharing part of your you know you have to share your uh, your your business records and everything. And uh, you want to kind of keep everybody straight. So you can get a pretty good idea, but you can also get an idea early on about whether you want to work with this particular group or whether you feel comfortable, you know, you're going to be communicating with these people afterwards and whether that's going to be a good fit or not. And that'll screen some people out. I checked them out online and they say um, it looks like they take over HR, legal, marketing, scheduling, um, do they do all of that or just if you're comfortable doing that? What did well, they take over for you that you no longer have to fiddle with? Yeah, ultimately they take over all of that stuff. You know, it's their it's their practice. So um and uh for the most part, you know, again, different groups are different. Some are gonna want to brand your office, some of them don't really care, although they may have like a tagline bra- uh, a branding of it. Right. Um, So it just kind of depends on the individual, but most of them are going to want things to kind of fit like their other groups. So we had not, we did not have electronic health records before we sold, but within about five months after we did, um, they're, they're planning, you know, I think they're doing some centralized billing, centralized scheduling, things like that, but we still have some scheduling and a little bit of billing and stuff too but the the whole idea is that they by converting to what they have is that's they're going to make do a better on their return on investment so how long has it been by the way that they've been on board um like a year and four or five months something like that 
Okay. How difficult was the transition or how easy was it? It wasn't bad at all. I mean, honestly, I mean, because again, for me, it's kind of an exit strategy. I mean, when you're the sole owner, you know, I make all the decisions and uh, if something needs to get done, then we get it done. So now decisions have to kind of go through a different type of a hierarchy or, you know, decision tree or something. And that's fine by me because uh, I've given up some, a lot of the headache stuff that I've had to deal with as the, as the owner in the past. So um, what, what has, uh, what I've given up on is made up for by the, the things that make my life a little easier. So no regrets of losing control? Because I don't know many surgeons who, who um, I mean, there's a reason you're in solo practice. Usually you like control. You like to do things your way. Was that a transition for you? So, I mean, I'm not solo practice. I'm so, I was the sole owner, but um, so not, not particularly difficult. I mean, you know, yeah, it's, it's different, but uh, I uh, I enjoy kind of being where in the same seat where my associates have been for all these years, you know, where I come in and take good care of my patients and uh, go home and I don't have to worry about the little things and stuff. So how does the agreement work? You, you still need to stay a, a while, correct? Yeah, you know, basically these companies are buying a business. They don't want, you know, if, if you're a big part of that business, they don't want you disappearing like uh, six months after the deal is done. So it really varies, you know, group to group um, and, you know, private equity group to private equity group. And it differs from practice to practice. If I was a solo practitioner by myself and somebody bought me, I would think that they would want me to stick around for a longer period of time because I'm the practice. And it'd be harder to replace me and for harder for them to get a return on investment. So it just makes sense for them to, you know, keep people long enough so that they get their return on investment and it doesn't disrupt things. So um, it really varies, you know, how long the groups will want you to be on. If you're a very large group, then you're maybe not quite as important, but they still want you to be around for a period of time. Can you say how long? Well, it really varies. I mean, uh, practice to practice and everything. I mean, some of them are three years, some of them are five years, some may be somewhere in between or more or less. I'm not sure, but somewhere around there, probably. Let me ask it this way. Is it more financially good for you to stay put? The longer you stay, the more money you make. Is it like that? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, you know, uh, again, the company wants to get make their profit. So I don't have control over overhead like I did before quite so much. You know, they have decisions that they make about doing this or doing that. So I'd say, you know, for, as an exit strategy, I think it makes sense. Um, if you were like brand new and, you know, started working five years ago and you're thinking that, okay, uh, I'm going to sell and then I'm going to work for these people for 20 years. That might be a little bit more of a challenge, but, you know, uh, and there are sometimes young people that do that, or maybe they sell and then they work their commitment and then they move outside of the restrictive covenant. But uh, for me, it was a good fit as uh, as an exit strategy. If you did want to walk away sooner than planned, can you, like, legally, does everything blow up or is there a way out if you wanted it? Um. I, I haven't really uh, evaluated that. <laughs> I'm trying to avoid any reason why I would stop stop working. So for me, it's about, you know, I'll continue working. You know, I have a contract with them. And if after that period of time, they want me to stay on and I'm enjoying what I'm doing, then I may stick, stay around or I may negotiate another contract and stay around. But um, I'm just kind of playing it by ear and seeing how things go. But I mean, if you leave, then the company has is is going to make it'll be more difficult for them to get their return on investment they've already put money up front so they're going to want to get some of that that money back i would imagine but i'm trying not to find out about that i guess so okay um i'm really curious about when you transition how how did it affect the staff and your other physicians was there a change in attitude was there a turnover 
uh, what happened with everyone? All the, all the doctors that were there before are still there, with the exception of one doctor who left, not so much related to the company, but uh, left a little while after. He was kind of a part-time person. Um, other than that, uh, everybody stayed. My staff, the ones that work around me anyway, are all still there um, for the most part. I mean, maybe one person's left. So it hasn't really changed uh, changed much. And when I sold, I wanted to make sure that I was communicating with my referral doctors about what was going on and that I wasn't leaving and that I was still going to be here and that things weren't going to change. And if there's any problem to give me a call or text me or something. So I wanted to make sure that everything still went as well as possible. So would you say, um, like, what percentage of your business is referral based? Because now I see what you're saying. Because I was thinking, if you're such a big practice, why would it matter if you left or not? But it's your referral base that they're interested in. Is that right? Well, well, they're they're interested in having somebody who brings, money, you know, a decent amount of money into the practice to stick around. So there's another Mohs surgeon in the practice. Um, who's been there for about a few years now. And uh, uh, we try to feed him as many of the in-house uh, referrals as possible. I mean, there's still a fair number of patients that want to see me. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of my practice is a referral from outside of the uh, walls of the building and stuff. So um, it's it's not related. It's, it, the company's concern wasn't necessarily the referrals from outside. They just want people that are generating a good uh, income to uh, stick around, whether it's me or whether it's the other Mohs surgeon. So they really like the Mohs part, right? Well, um, yeah, because it's skin cancer and mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things that uh, in uh, good economies and not so good economies, there's still going to be skin cancer. Um, you know, the downside is, uh, you're dependent on insurance. Commercial carriers, you know, are not paying like what they did 10 or 20 years ago. And uh, they have to deal with that. And uh, but, yeah, you know, business of skin cancer is is attractive, just like the other things like cosmetic and the derm path. Yeah. And uh, did the facial plastic surgeon stay put or was he just a plastic surgeon? Yeah, no, he's he, he's facial plastics and. Uh, yeah, he's still working there as before, oh. and I'm hoping that uh, he will get busier with, uh, you know, the addition of other uh, groups, you know, that this company is going to uh, try to uh, bring on board as well. So hopefully he'll get busier with that as well. Well, you were also offering a lot of cosmetic non-surgical treatments. Was that, did that play a part in this? Was that valuable to them? I, yeah, I think all of it comes into play and is in, interesting to them. You know, they have, like, as you point out, it's a fairly good sized company, new to California. Um, so they have other uh, groups that do that, other dermatology groups. I think they do have some other facial plastics people in, in the in the uh, company too, but more consistently, it's a lot of dermatology stuff and the kind of cosmetic things that dermatologists do. So what's the best part about this transaction? Uh, for me, like I said, it's uh, it's that I get to go home and not worry about the you know, crazy little things or worry about payroll or worry about, um, you know, dealing with HR issues, you know, employee issues. And, you know, in a state like California, that's, that's not a bad thing to have to give up and stuff. So, um, so like I said, for me, it's the best part, I guess, is the security, knowing that, you know, I don't have to worry about that stuff or that my family wouldn't have to worry about it. And then what's the worst part about this transaction? Uh, well, you know, I I don't control everything anymore. So, you know, it's that's that's the worst part. So it's kind of like it's it's they're both related. Yeah. So but I'm OK with that. You know, like I said, I've, I've, I've been the person that was in charge of everything for almost 30 years and uh, sound like a good time to, uh, you know, hand over the reins to somebody else. And no regrets? No. 
Nice. Any advice for somebody else thinking about this? Even if they're, um, you know, usually I work with plastic surgeons, but any advice with that? With, for um, that? You know, kind of is, uh, you know, number one would be, uh, you know, vet your potential buyers. You know, you want to make sure you understand these people. These are the people that after the deal, you're going to be uh, asking for things or talking to them about things. So make sure that you can see yourself working with these people. Uh, number two is, uh, you know, I guess number two, I think a really important thing is to understand that when you get to the point where you're signing an LOI, a letter of intent, if it's not in the LOI, it's really hard to get it afterwards. So let's say you want to have your consultation room still all yours for when when you're there five days a week or whatever. Let's say you want to have two two nurses of similar quality working with you all the time. Let's say that you want whatever the same number of days of vacation or whatever it is, or you know make sure it's in the LOI. And again, you know a good attorney who's uh, experienced in mergers and acquisitions uh, should should know that and should tell you that. I mean, I learned that from listening to a lecture once in, in, a, in a dermatology or dermatologic surgery uh, lecture. And I just think it's a really good advice. So I think that's important. Um, you know, think about uh, what you're going to want your practice to be like and make sure that um, make sure that it's it's good for you. It's good for your associate physicians if you have associates. And it's good for your staff and your patients too. You know, you don't want to sell and then be miserable or have your staff miserable or your patients miserable. So make sure that they're gonna pay, you know, your staff and your and and not gonna try to make things uh more challenging for your patients. Make sure that your doctors can get a hold of you and everything afterwards. Has your golf game improved since you've transitioned? You would have thought. You would have thought. So maybe when I ultimately retire, re retire maybe when I ultimately retire, yeah. I'll be able to fix that. But right now, I'm basically better at most surgery and reconstruction than I am at uh, golf. And okay. Good to know. And the last question, just out of sheer curiosity, tell us something we don't already know about you. Uh. Well, I mean, I collect medical, surgical, and apothecary antiques. Is that what's behind you? Uh, yeah, that's part of it. Wow. Uh, okay, that's unusual. I haven't heard that before. There you go. So, yeah. yeah, so anything from surgical sets to antique stethoscopes to mouvages, which are wax models, to uh, books, textbooks related, you know, things like that. Like how far back? Um, I have a pretty good collection. So, uh, you know, I have, you know, I, I probably don't buy much anymore unless it's like 18th century or something or something really special yeah. so from the 1700s, which is a long time ago. And those things are fewer and far between. Um, but yeah, it's kind of fun. And, you know, as a physician, it's kind of fun to, uh, you know, appreciate that, that stuff and appreciate how things have changed in just the last hundred years or so. Right. So fascinating. Well, thank you so much. If anybody wanted to talk with you, how would they get a hold of you? My best option is probably to, to reach out by uh, telephone, you know, at my office, 805-497-1694. Uh, um, and like I said, best option is find yourself. Don't necessarily go with your accountant or your attorney. Mm -hmm. Find somebody that's going to represent you well. and. Uh, uh, come up with a good uh, game plan and make sure that you're protected and they're taking good care of you. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman. And that's going to take care of it for us today at Beauty and the Biz. So please subscribe if you haven't already. And a nice review would also be much appreciated. And then if you've got any questions for me, you can leave them on my website at katherinemaley.com or you can certainly DM me on Instagram at MBA. Thanks so much. We'll talk again soon. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want, but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too. 
but it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to cosmeticpracticevault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues. We hope you found valuable insight on this episode of Beauty and the Biz. For more episodes, tools, and Catherine's free book, visit www.catherinemailey.com. That's www.c-a-t-h-e-r-i-n-e-m-a-l-e-y.com. And be sure to subscribe to get the latest practice building strategies delivered to you. And don't forget to share this Beauty and the Biz podcast with your staff and colleagues.